Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is using SunPath charts. Our objective today is to familiarize ourselves with SunPath charts and use them to determine the general position of the sun at a given date and time. Along the way we'll discuss the difference between solar time and standard time. Finally we'll briefly mention the use of SunPath charts and shading analysis for a PV array. Given prerequisite understandings of tilted orientation and peak sun hours, both topics featured in the Big Bad Tech playlist, the SunPath chart lecture should be short and easy. If you don't have these lectures under your belt, I strongly recommend you get them there before continuing. With this prerequisite knowledge, you realize that for a specific geographic location, the sun is traveling the same band of sky every year. It's known as the solar window. This three-dimensional band could be represented two-dimensionally in a flat sheet of paper using three measurements, orientation, elevation, and time. This is very similar to cartography, where a three-dimensional sphere like the Earth is displayed in a more convenient and foldable two-dimensional map. This is pretty easy to understand, but realize there are some odd effects when you try to represent 3D objects using just two dimensions. These oddities come into play with the sun path charts at lower tropical latitudes and higher arctic latitudes. We'll get into these irregularities later. Understand for your location, one can measure the orientation or angular position of the sunrise throughout the course of the day as well as this angular elevation above the horizon at specific times. If one was facing south or 180 degrees from true north, you'd have east at 90 degrees to your left and west at 270 degrees to your right. You could then plot these two coordinates of orientation and elevation on a two-dimensional chart. The moment the sun rises, the elevation is at zero degrees with respect to the horizon. As it rises, it will move westward across the sky with an increasing elevation angle. It will reach some maximum elevation angle at solar noon and then begin setting until it disappears on the western horizon where the elevation angle is again zero degrees. Over the course of a day, the sun will scribe a single line through the sky where each point on this line is capable of being relayed with three data points, namely orientation, elevation, and time. At this particular day, at 10 a.m., the sun will be at 130 degrees orientation and 25 degrees elevation with respect to the horizon. Notice at both 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. the sun will be at 25 degree elevation. The only difference being that the sun at 10 a.m. will be in the eastern half of the sky and the sun at 4 p.m. will be in the western half of the sky at roughly 240 degrees orientation. The daily paths scribed by the sun could be averaged on a monthly basis and then a whole year shown on a single chart with 12 different average paths on it. Realize though 12 paths is kind of an overkill because between the winter and summer solstice minimum and maximum paths, the sun is kind of like an REM song in that it just repeats itself over and over. For every November there's a January, for every October there's a February, for every September there's a March, for every August there's an April, and for every July there's a May. So sometimes you'll see more than one month represented by a single path. So far, all this should seem very obvious and very easy to understand. The single most difficult aspect of understanding sun paths and the prime source of some of the inconsistencies we'll be discussing soon is the choice of units and the means of measuring those units. First, realize orientation is measured in degrees from true north, and it is not measured from magnetic north. This is an important distinction covered extensively in the solar side analysis tilt and orientation factor lecture. Failing to account for this difference, or worse yet, accounting for this difference incorrectly means your PV system will explode into a million sharp and hot pieces. Just kidding. Your system won't explode, but you will look exceedingly stupid when you point your system west and the sun rises in the east. The angular system of units used for orientation is units of degrees. Degrees are measured clockwise from true north at zero degrees, traveling east to 90 degrees, south to 180 degrees, and west to 270 degrees. If we continue traveling clockwise, we hit 359.999999 degrees and instantaneously and disjointedly find ourselves back to zero degrees or true north. This instantaneous numeric jump means absolutely nothing and only means we're transitioning from one side to the other around true north. If your chart is centered, such that you're looking true south, all angles in this northern region mean is that something is behind your head. If you had a pet owl 
and trained it to fly in a complete circle around you at a 15 degree elevation, its path would look like this. If the owl started behind your head at 0 degrees and traveled clockwise, it hit 90 degrees, then 180 degrees, then 270 degrees, then 360 degrees and be right back at 0 degrees. It's not like the owl suddenly teleported from one side of the sky to the next, like Pac-Man ducking out the side of Maze World and popping out the other. The owl is still flying a complete and continuous circle. It's just that the units you use to describe this behavior do so discontinuously. Elevation and units of degrees are similar. In the case of elevation, however, we wouldn't expect discontinuous jumps like orientation. Elevation is the sun's angular position with respect to the horizon. Whether the sun is in front of you, behind you, or off to either side, you will still always measure elevation with respect to the horizon. Some people talk about zenith angle, but this is something totally different than elevation angle. Zenith angle is actually a measurement of the sun's angular deviation from straight overhead, or zenith conditions. Zenith angle and elevation angle added together make 90 degrees. You can probably kind of purge your memory about zenith angles because sun path charts use elevation angle. In our previous example of the pet owl flying in a complete circle around your head at a constant elevation, the elevation was constant. If it was to dip down at due south and snatch your neighbor's annoying yip-yip dog up with its sharp talons and return to the sky, our elevation chart would look something like this. If, however, our owl was resting due east and took to the sky up to 15 degree elevation and flew clockwise to due west across the southern half of your field of vision and then landed, the flight path would look something like this, and our two-dimensional chart would look like this. If, however, the owl was resting due east and took to the sky up to a 15 degree elevation and then flew counterclockwise to due west across the northern half of our field of vision and landed, the flight path would look like this, and our chart would look like this. It's not like it's a magic owl. It's just an ordinary owl, albeit a highly trained one, that's flying behind your head when you're looking south. The flight path displayed on the chart looks weird when using two dimensions because of our discontinuous choice of units. Leaving the talk of well-trained owls behind, realize the sun's path will also appear strange when displayed on a two-dimensional chart if it was to go behind you or perhaps never set. In the case of tropical or low latitudes, realize the sun might be in the northern half of the sky or behind you if you're looking south at certain times of the year. In high latitude locations, midsummer, the sun never sets therefore the elevation never becomes zero and as it revolves around behind you it reappears on the other side. Now that we've got a basic understanding of a sun path chart and can predict some of the irregularities we might see, let's take a look at some real ones. To obtain a sun path chart for your location is astoundingly easy. All you need to do is spend every waking minute over the course of an entire year staring at the sun and meticulously recording angular data. Actually it's much easier than that because the University of Oregon's Solar Radiation Monitoring Laboratory has a free online resource that will calculate a sun path chart for your location quasi-instantaneously. Go to the internet, but don't stay too long, and search for the term sun path chart. Chances are the first link that'll show up is U of O S R M L sun chart program. If you don't know how to use Google, have an 11 year old show you how. If you're using Bing, this is your first clue that you're using the internet wrong. The U of O sun chart program is very easy to use and has all sorts of options that you will most likely never have a use for. First and foremost, make sure you're using the version with Cartesian or regular rectangular coordinates and not the one with polar coordinates. One simply inputs a location based off intersecting lines of latitude and longitude or a five digit US zip code. Sometimes you have to enter a verification code and then you just pull the trigger with default options selected. What the program does is consult the mathematical model developed by the bespectacled nerds at U of O to describe the orbital path of the Earth around the Sun. It outputs positional data of the Sun as seen from a given location on Earth as it revolves around the Sun, rotating as it does so. If you input positional data for something in the mid-latitudes between the tropics and Arctic regions, the Sun kind of does what you expect it to, because the Sun path chart shows the Sun rising, climbing, and topping out and falling and finally settling all within a predictable and easy to understand solar window that for the most part is kind of right in front of you. Here's the sun path chart for the Dalles, Oregon. 
Notice the winter sun in the month of December rises at roughly 120 degrees, reaches a maximum elevation angle slightly greater than 20 degrees at solar noon, and sets at an angle just shy of 240 degrees. This is in contrast to the summer sun in the month of June, where it rises significantly east of its winter sunrise position at slightly less than 60 degrees, and tops out at roughly 67.5 degrees elevation angle at solar noon, and sets at slightly higher than 300 degrees. At any given time of any given month, we can determine the sun's angular position for orientation and elevation. For example, at 8 a.m. in February, we'd expect our sun to be 120 degrees, at roughly an 11 degree elevation. If, however, we chose to chart a region within the tropics, or below 23.5 degrees latitude, your sun path chart will show some irregularities, simply because the sun will be in the northern half of the sky or behind you at some times of the year. Here's the sun path chart for De Efe, Mexico City, and 19.4 degrees north, 99.1 degrees west. Notice the month of May and June, the sun is actually behind you, or in the northern half of the sky. Finally, in regions above the Arctic Circle, there will show summer sun paths where the sun simply misses the horizon and never sets. Here's the sun path chart for the northernmost city in the U.S., Barrow, Alaska. Notice the summer sun path never reaches zero degrees and simply revolves at low elevation in a complete circle around the horizon. It's interesting to note that on these charts for higher latitudes, sometimes there simply is no path for certain winter months because the sun never rises above the horizon. Not exactly the time of year to consider solar. Notice for all of these sun path charts, the time when the sun reaches maximum elevation is exactly at noon, or more appropriately, solar noon. By definition, solar noon is the time when the sun reaches maximum elevation, and local noon, meaning the time you read on your cell phone display, might be slightly different depending on your location. This differential is pretty inconsequential for most of us. But an understanding this differential really goes to reinforce the dynamic behavior of the Sun and Earth. As the Earth performs its 24-hour rotation, the focus of the Sun's intensity will do a slow crawl across the continent, and it is at this time when the folks in the 1800s used to set their watches to high noon. This means that each town had slightly different times as you progressively cross the country in your top hat and steam-driven locomotive. This progressive difference shouldn't be shocking because we still have time zones. Time zones were established to rid the problems of different towns using different times and voided the necessity of constantly having to reset your watch as you traveled from one town to the next. There's still a differential, but towns within the same time zone all use the same local time. This means, however, that solar noon, or the time when the sun reaches its maximum elevation, may or may not occur at the same time as local noon. The local time used for each zone is established at 15 degree intervals, meaning only at these meridians do solar and local noon occur at the same time. Regions to the east of a meridian experience solar noon, or the time when the sun is at the highest in the sky, earlier than local noon, and regions to the west of a meridian experience solar noon later than local noon. In the Pacific Northwest, where I live, we use 120 degrees as the base for our time zone. This median bisects most of the west coast and is only really problematic for those individuals in eastern Oregon and southern Idaho. These regions are actually in the Rocky Mountain time zone at 105 degrees. To further complicate matters for Idaho, the northern half of it, i.e. the good half of Idaho, uses Pacific time. All this means is that someone in the extreme eastern end of Idaho's northern half will experience high noon substantially earlier than their local time, and someone in eastern Oregon in the Rocky Mountain time zone will experience high noon substantially later than when their cell phone says 12 o'clock. There are mathematical equations that could be used to determine the time differential between solar noon and local noon based upon your location, where every degree of longitude differential between your location and the standard meridian used for your time zone is equivalent to four minutes. And by accounting for daylight savings time and the eccentricities of orbit using something called the equation of time, but this is really useless busy work. Because if you really want to get into nitnoid detail, all you have to do is use the University of Oregon Solar Radiation Monitor Lab Sun Path Chart Program and just select Local Time versus Solar Time option. Notice when I select the Local Time option for the Dalles, Oregon, 
there's a little wiggle waggle in the times at which the sun experiences certain angular positions. What does all this mean? It means don't expect the sun to be exactly at the highest point at exactly noon unless you live right on a standard meridian, even slightly to one side or the other. The Dallas, Oregon at 121 degrees west is really close to the 120 degree meridian used for our local time for the Pacific time zone, so the deviation is not that significant. Now that we understand what sun path charts are displaying, how to read them, and can use a handy software resource to generate them, let's talk about why we use them. The purpose of a sun path chart is to determine potential shading obstructions in the path of our solar resource at certain times of the year. With a sun path chart for your location, one can visit the site of a potential PV system and observe and measure obstructions superimposed on the sun path chart. Based upon this analysis, one can relocate the system or perhaps remove the obstacles that are causing the obstructions. This is worthy of another lecture entirely and is called shading analysis, a crucial step in solar site analysis. As a preview, shading analysis is a time variant efficiency measurement of a PV system performance. It's pretty easy to understand if you can read a sun path chart and know how to obtain peak sun hours using an NREL data sheet. If on a typical day in June contains five hours of peak sunlight, it stands to conjecture an unobstructed complete path of the sun in June is 100% of five hours. If, however, a certain percentage of this path is covered by an obstacle on a typical day in June, let's say 10%, each day in June must be reduced by this amount. Therefore, our system would only experience 4.5 hours of peak sun. Realize regions in the early morning and late evening obviously experience less intensity, so regions on the shoulder of our sun path aren't nearly as important as the center of mass. The rule of thumb is to keep it shade free from 9 to 3. Again, an in-depth discussion of shading analysis will occur in a later lecture, but this skill necessarily requires a basic literacy of sun path charts. It's my hope that this lecture you gain this literacy. Until then, I highly encourage you to visit the University of Oregon Solar Radiation Monitoring Laboratory Sun Path Chart Program and confirm the position of the sun for your location given a sun path chart. Use a compass to measure orientation from true north, an inclinometer or protractor and a plumb bob combination to measure elevation angle. If you find the sun in the wrong place, do not hesitate to notify your local law officer or take matters into your own hands and peg it with some sling thrown rocks. Don't stare at the sun too long because you might go crazy. All right, we've covered enough material for this session and arrived at a point where we need to wrap it up and send you back to the real world feeling like you've learned something. In conclusion, we've familiarized ourselves with sun path charts produced by the University of Oregon Solar Radiation Monitoring Lab. We use these charts to determine the angular orientation and elevation of the sun at a given time and date and realized a basic literacy of sun path charts is a prerequisite for shading analysis. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well your PV system will perform if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech playlist for additional resources and updates.